It's June 2005. A young woman is sitting on a subway car in Seoul, South Korea, and she's holding a small dog on her lap. The dog defecates on the floor, and in spite of numerous requests to clean it up, she doesn't. Someone captures the whole incident on their phone, and they post it online. Before we know what's happened, it's everywhere, she's publicly shamed, and she becomes known as, rather unflatteringly, Dog Poop Girl. Well, her identity is also posted online, and pretty soon she's in desperate straits, and she quits her position at the university. I'm not posting any visuals here because that would just add to the problem. But we all know the situation. Someone does something irresponsible and they face widespread online shaming. Is this really the job of the media? Is it the job of social media? And who can stop it? How should the victims of such shaming respond? Isn't it the job of the law to pass judgment on someone who behaves wrongly? And what exactly is this public where the person is publicly shamed anyway? Can we even call it a public or is it something else? And what exact role does and should the media play in the entire situation? Is this a public deliberation where the media is somehow passing information or is it passing judgment, judgment outside a court of law? These questions are vital for a functional democracy. And this was recognized 35 years before Dog Poop Girl by Heinrich Böll. It was the early 1970s, and Germany was experiencing the scene of widespread and often violent left-wing activism. Where did this violence come from? In the mid-1960s, the streets of German cities were filled with protesting students and workers. It was the so-called student revolution. On the 2nd of June 1967, the student Benno Ohnesorg was shot and killed by a policeman while he was protesting on the streets of Berlin. Germany's largest newspaper, the Bild Zeitung, was covering all of the student protests and they were taking a very strong stance against them. This was the newspaper with the widest readership in the entire country. It depicted the protesting students as aggressors and the police more or less as victims in spite of evidence to the contrary. And it played a major role in pushing public opinion in one particular direction. Build had acquired its large market share through this kind of sensationalist reporting, also through pictures of women in bikinis. They wrote, the students threaten us and we shoot back. On the 11th of April 1968, the student leader Rudi Dutschke was shot, and many people blamed the Bild's irresponsible reporting for this incident. It had been portraying him as a terrorist. Now, the word terrorist was a very charged word at the time, and it was taken to refer to left-wing terrorism. Today, when we hear the word, we think of the stereotyping of Muslims, but back then it was the stereotyping of the left wing, the stereotyping of communists and socialists. During protests, the offices of the publishing house that ran Bild, the Springer Verlag, were attacked repeatedly and um, they were set on fire. The offices in uh, Hamburg were, were um, surrounded, and the Munich offices were destroyed by protesting students. Back then, being accused of being a terrorist or even being in league with terrorists was a serious matter. If you said terrorist, then you immediately meant the left wing. And the Bild newspaper was also making direct reference to the so-called Red Army fraction, the RAF. 
This was the most notorious um, so-called terrorist organization in Germany at the time. It had been founded by Andreas Bader, Horst Mahler, Gudrun Enzlin, and Ulrike Meinhof. It was responsible for bank robberies, for dynamiting buildings, for kidnappings, also for several murders. In fact, the RAF murdered more than 30 people and um, all of Germany was in an uproar because of them. So any kind of reference to them would have been a very, very pointed reference. The Bild newspaper was virulent in its denunciation of the RAF. And you can look at headline after headline from those days, and you see always the same sensationalist references, but very, very little analysis, and certainly not the question, what causes violence? Where did it come from? Could it have been prevented before it even happened? And the RAF hit back at the newspaper in 1972. Their offices in Hamburg were bombed. The intelligentsia and the writers responded to this, and many members of the Gruppe 47, the group of 1947, remember them, including Günter Grass, many of them denounced the newspaper. They called for a boycott of the newspaper. And their main reason for this was they felt that this kind of irresponsible sensationalist reporting, this widespread formation of public opinion, was fundamentally undermining parliamentary democracy. The question they put to the newspaper is the same question we put to social media today. Should the media have the power to form public opinion outside of the law. In 1971, a bank was robbed in Kaiserslautern in West Germany, and a police officer was shot. Bild immediately announced that the crime had been committed by the Bader-Meinhof group and the Red Army faction, although there was no evidence supporting this as yet. This unsupported judgment passed by Germany's largest newspaper infuriated the 54-year-old writer Heinrich Böll. How can we permit public pronunciations of guilt without any due legal process? And how does a writer respond to this misuse of the public voice? Böll's answer was a short novel, Die verlorene Ehre der Katharina Blum, The Lost Honor of Katharina Blum, which we're reading this week. And Böll gave his book the subtitle, how violence develops and where it can lead. This is an analytical question, it's a political question, and it's a very different kind of a question from the superficial sensationalist denunciation that was being practiced by uh, newspapers like Bild. And Bild felt that this kind of analysis was exactly what was called for. In 1972, he wrote an essay which was published in the weekly news magazine Spiegel, and he gave it the title, Is Ulrike, referring to Ulrike Meinhof, Is Ulrike Asking for Pardon or for Safe Passage? In it, he criticized the Bild for its reporting, and he wrote, This is no longer crypto-fascist, no longer quasi-fascist. It's naked fascism, sedition, lies, filth. This form of demagogy would not even be justified if the suspicions held by the Kaiserslautern police were to be proven correct. In any manifestation of states founded in law, any accused has the right that, if an accusation is to be published, it is emphasized that it is only a suspicion. The headline, Bader Meinhof Group Keeps Murdering, is an incitement to lynch mob justice. In this way, millions whose only source of information is Bild are fed false information. Bild responded, of course, attacking Böll and comparing him to the Nazi propaganda minister Goebbels. They wrote, the Bulls are more dangerous than Bader Meinhof. And Böll also faced widespread public condemnation from right-wing commentators. This was made worse by the fact that Böll's son, the sculptor Raymond, who was 27 years old, had been visited recently 
by an RAF activist, Margaret Schiller, and then he was accused of being in league with the terrorists and being a supporter of the terrorists. Bild wrote the headline, Police Interrogate Bull's Son, and they delved into his past and they wrote that he had been a poor student, especially when it came to German studies. And they referred to his art. They published the headline, Bull Jr. Decapitates Dolls, What the Nobel Prize Winner's Son Thinks Art Is. And Bull responded with the novel. It tells the story of Katharina Blum. She spends the night with Ludwig Goethen, who had robbed a bank and was being sought by the police. He was suspected of terrorism. The Boulevard Press, um, which is simply called The News in the novel, had already passed judgment on him for being a terrorist. It turns out he wasn't, in fact. He was just an ordinary, everyday, field and garden variety bank robber, not a terrorist. But that didn't matter because public judgment had already been passed. And public judgment is passed on Katerina as being a complicit in terrorist activities, being a supporter of the terrorists. She's interrogated by the police and the interrogation, the entire process, is reported sensationally by the news with the result that she is publicly shamed, they delve into her past, they find out facts, well, pseudo-facts, um, information, let's call it, about her past, about her friends, and they distort it and twist it and report it to make her look like a petty criminal with sexual overtones, and they refer to her in these terms. She's hounded in particular by one reporter who is called Tötkes in the novel, and she becomes so desperate that in the end she pretends to want to be interviewed by him. He comes to her apartment and she shoots him. Then she turns herself over to the police. She shoots him immediately after he makes sexual advances towards her. So we see this compound thematics of terrorism, sensationalism, criminal activities, the law, the police, and sexual harassment. The novel was a bestseller, and it would later be filmed by Volker Schlöndorf in 1975. Remember him? He filmed The Tin Drum in 1979. By the time Böll wrote Katharina Blum, he'd already published over 20 volumes of stories, novels, essays, and radio plays, and he was widely read throughout Germany. He was one of Germany's best-known authors. Starting in 1949, he'd written a story called Der Mann mit den Messern, The Man with the Knives, and most recently he'd published a book called Gruppenbild mit Dame, translated into English as Group Portrait with Ladies. This was published in 1971 in the German. And it tells the story of Leni Pfeiffer, who falls in love with a Russian prisoner of war, and they have a child together, resulting in her being ostracized and outcast and branded as the blonde Soviet whore. You can see the similarities to Katerina Blum. He's interested in how Individuals become outcast, become prejudged in public because of an action which is all too human and really deserves a more subtle approach. It deserves an analytic approach. Bull was 10 years older than Günter Grass. He, like Grass, came from a middle class Catholic family, a family that was opposed to the Nazis. His father had a cabinet-making business, and um, the business was bankrupt in the inflationary years around the early 20s, and the family was plunged into poverty. Bull trained for a short time as a bookseller, and then in 1939 he started studying German literature and the classics in Cologne. That same year, however, he was drafted into the German army, and he ended up spending the rest of the war as a soldier, working primarily as an interpreter. In 19, 
1945, he was made a prisoner of war by the Americans, and he was imprisoned for five months. When he was released, he took various odd jobs, and he started out a literary career, what was to be a long and successful literary career. And like so many writers of those years, his literary activities started with the group of 47. In 1951, he read some of his stories to the group. This was generally how writers um, gained acceptance and, and made a name for themselves. And he won the prize of the group, which back then was a thousand German marks. It was um, a reasonable amount of money. And this also got him a contract with the um, high-profile publishing house Kiepenhauer and Witsch. In the decades that followed, he became one of Germany's most successful writers. He was also politically active in matters of civil rights. Um, he was active in South American liberation movements, and he was also an activist supporting Vietnamese refugees, refugees from the Vietnam War. Bo died in 1985, and when the Nobel Prize Committee awarded him the prize for literature in 1972, they awarded it for his writing, which, through its combination of a broad perspective on its time and a sensitive skill in characterization, has contributed to a renewal of German literature. <laughs>